Tom, it's wonderful having you here in Witchwood Park at number three, right in my own back garden. Never thought it would happen. Well, I didn't either. I think you've got the best uh, putting green in town here. It's great stuff. I, you know? It's a bit rough for putting <laughs> because of the acorns. Yeah. And uh, uh, how here. Yeah. croquet is better. <laughs> it, it rolls over the acorns quite well. But uh, it is a, it's grand uh, being able to just sit down and talk about some of the things that we're interested in. And uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by the fact that you uh, are from the South. And uh, I've always had an interest in the South. My wife is from the South. That's right, she's from uh, Fort Worth. From Fort it? Worth. Yeah, yeah. I, I was interested, you see, in the fact that you were a Southerner, Tom, and that uh, this relation to an oral tradition is a great advantage to a literary man. In the 20th century, it's very remarkable that all the best writing has come out of Ireland or the American South uh, because of this close relation that the English language has to the spoken word in those areas. And uh, this, too, seems to have something to do with the existence of jazz and rock as art forms, that without an oral tradition of corporate public address, there, this kind of music would not occur. I'm sure a lot of it also has to do with preaching. Well, there yeah. again is a public address system. Because there's, I really can't think of any part of the country where preaching um, among both black and white uh, preachers is, uh, has had such prominence and where people get so f fulsome in their expression. And whether it's the very stilted kind of speech that the Southern Episcopalian <coughs> minister uh, uses with the, the uh expressions, uh, for, uh, forgive us our, our, our trespasses uh, and, uh, and these very the, intentional, the, the, it's, it's kind of an English uh, well, those, mannerism. Those hesitations and those intervals are actually very involving. It makes the audience just hang on the next phrase. It's like a stutterer who keeps you just on the ropes waiting for him to form another word. This, this whole idea of an oral tradition uh, certainly did come back with the beat generation. And you got in fact, I think it was the main contribution to people like Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso and uh, Ferlin Getty made was to just, uh -huh. just to break up the academic portrait which had become so strong after the Second World War, and which was a very formal, rigid... Uh, which, uh, which kind of poets do you have in mind up by uh, the word academic? Well, the whole, everyone, the... the Practically okay. everyone who was reviewed in the Kenyon Review and the... Oh, I see. Um, well, that would include all the Southern poets and the Irish poets and uh, some of the British poets. But the, acad the academic, uh, the establishment, the poetic establishment, you meant had built up around the academic study of Pound and Eliot and Yeats? I think the people who took off from Pound and Eliot and who were writing uh, after the war were really neglected the, the oral side of, say, of someone like Eliot. Oh, yeah. or Pound, and we're, we're more in love with the fact that someone like Pound was filling his work with, with uh, scholarly allusions, with mythical allusions, and it became, it became a totally... Well, uh, mythic study, yeah, you know, and uh, very uh, anthropologically oriented, archaeologically oriented, very learned. But the fact is those poets themselves came out of the age of radio and would have been unthinkable without that radio ground around them. And the whole of the English language took on a tremendous new oral life from radio. I'm sure that, uh, that this was carried straight on into jazz and rock music. Well, a lot of poets were being, in, in England particularly, were being read on the air, weren't they? In, uh, and recorded. In the late 30s. I, and uh, there, there was a great uh, disc presentation of poetry in the uh, 30s, especially. And this is, you know, this has become even truer today in that when so many poets really make their living, uh, it's the only way they can make a living, is going around to universities and giving readings. And I really think it's done a great deal for, oh, yeah. uh, for poetry. Because On the other hand, there has been a, a demand for this. The, this, the, uh, the public wants uh, to confront the poets. But the, surely okay. the, 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 the poets have been writing for radio. There have been all sorts of radio, po poetry plays and, and poems written and songs written for radio and for TV, why, why, why don't we just uh, um, consider the tremendous publics opened up to what formerly had been rather limited 
publics with the written or printed forms, the tremendous new publics opened up by the television and radio for poetry and drama and stories. Well, a big mistake people uh, who are writing for those media make is that, that they don't collect their, what they've done for television or for radio and put it in a book. Because once it's in a book, it's, it exists for the first time in the, official, uh, yeah. in the official sense. I discovered myself that I wrote, I must have written 110 magazine articles. It's even true in, in print, or sorry, sorry, magazine articles. Once I collected them into a book, they take uh -huh. on a totally different character. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're more portable. The magazine gets, uh, is expendable and dis uh, uh, disposable. The book is still retained. The pocketbook, of course, tends to suffer the fate of the magazine. It gets handed around from person to person and tossed into corners and so on. But the uh, various, you feel that the uh, writers often get lost just in the media. They toil away as script writers for film, for TV, for radio, and uh, their work doesn't show. It disappears into the ether, really. Yeah. And then uh, they become very frustrated. And... But by going to campuses and uh, reading to big publics, they recapture their relationship to their audience. I think the poets do, yeah. yeah. Also, I think it improves their, it often improves their writing because they know they're going to have to read it. Oh. They have, to, they have to make it sound good out loud. Do you know that there's very little prose that you can read out loud? The moment uh, most prose has never been written for the ear at all, and uh, the, uh, when you have to suddenly read it in public, a quote, you suddenly realize you're reading the work of a man who never heard what he was writing. Well, a lot of, a lot of dialogue is very convincing in novels. When someone tries to put it on the screen, it's terrible. And it, I, I imagine that Dickens might suffer that fate. Um, I'm not sure. They, he have, there have been quite a number of uh, movies made of his work. I suppose they've been adapted to, rather than just mm. repeated. Yeah, I don't know whether they've actually but used it. The there, there is a real oral tradition behind Dickens. He's not a literary man and only became respectable as a literary figure in the 30s, 40s. In fact, I don't think until television did the English critics accept Dickens as a serious literary force. He was farce, not force, <laughs> up until TV. I, I'm sure the future of the writer is not exactly the 19th century future, but I'm sure that it's bigger than anything the 19th century ever dreamed of. Well, writers still have a few uh, exclusive tricks up their sleeves. The, so far, film, whether it's television or in a movie theater or anything else, has never managed to uh, to use point of view. Uh, they've tried everything. They've tried voiceover, they've tried uh, acting as if the actor were eye holes were a camera and so he could only see himself in a mirror and that sort of thing. But a point uh, of view requires stasis and that's uh, not involvement. So these new media demand that you get involved and uh, you become part of the action. The TV image is not like the film image, a simple snapshot. It is an actual live vortex in action and it, I think, is behind what we call the happening. TV itself is a kind of happening, technically, and it tends to involve people in its own vortex. And the, what is called in uh, the new journalism, the happening, what Norman Mailer calls the novel as history, the history as novel, is a kind of use of the total environment as a surround or as a vortex of action in which everybody, the reader and the characters are all involved. His visits to the Democratic and, and uh, the Chicago conventions and so on are a nice opportunity in which to show vortex. I think that's where most of the important uh, changes, certainly during the 1960s, took place, actually. It wasn't, I think a hundred years from now, uh, historians, uh, that's assuming that the Chinese will have any interest in uh, current uh, history. <laughs> we won't, won't look at the 1960s in the case of, say, the United States as the era of the war in Vietnam or the moonshot or anything of that sort. I think it'll be looked at in terms of the way what you referred to as the, the ground has changed, the way, different, the way people's lives, people have changed their ways of, uh, of living. We used to concentrate um, on figures, and now the ground itself has become figure. The area of attention has shifted from the older characters 
and uh, to the ground. Now that includes audience. The audience has now become actor. Don't you think in, this is a tendency as a result of developments in our time? Well, certainly Woodstock is a perfect example of that. Woodstock is probably the great typical event of our times because... Instant city. It was set up from the very beginning there was going to be a movie made of Woodstock. And rather than the people, as it started, I think everyone was paying their $18 for the weekend. Gradually, so many people came, they just abandoned that and let them all come in. Well, actually, they should have paid them all $18 as they came in, because they, were the, they became the show. Uh, and Ken Kesey and the, his group, the Merry Pranksters, their, their whole idea when they started these uh, acid tests through California, where they would get uh, 500 people in a hall and give everyone LSD and have lights uh, and everything, was that there would be no longer any separation between the performer and the audience. Right. That uh, Kesey himself said, I'm tired of, he said he was oh. no longer going to write novels because he was tired of being a seismograph. He wanted to be a lightning rod. Well, and consider, uh, in that regard, what's, what we call coverage. Coverage now is no longer just uh, on a single individual, but on a whole complex action. Th that in turn, don't you think that in both in Vietnam, in Ireland, the north of Ireland, the audience wants to get into the action that the coverage encourages the audience to get into the action. I have been told by reporters from the north of Ireland that the, when the news is not on, there, and the cameras are ready to go, the public is all out in the streets, ready to go into action as soon as the cameras are. That's marvelous. That they all retire inside to watch the news and then come outside to participate in covering the news and in acting it out themselves. Now, I think the difference between hired actors and the public itself is tending to merge. Isn't that what you're saying? This kind of unexpected flip, it happened in the Eichmann trial. The uh, coverage pushes up the figure into heroic dimensions dramatically, but at the same time involves the audience so completely in the process of his action that they begin to feel far more guilty than he did. He appears merely as a person carrying out orders, the orders of the community. He was a well-adjusted, nice guy who was doing what had to be done according to the audience command. The audience being so involved in this process that they now begin to feel like villain. Therefore, they want to cut that show right out of their lives. But the happening, I think, is of this kind. It's the a situation in which audience and action become one, in which audience becomes actor and not spectator. And so in the, in the uh, uh, Truman Capote, the, in the cold blood, the audience becomes actor. Well, you know, one reason that the uh, in cold blood made such a splash was that you had a, um, a novelist whose reputation had just been drifting downhill for over oh, seven or eight years suddenly turning to nonfiction in a novelistic uh, manner and completely re recouping his, uh, his standing and, and, in fact, becoming a much bigger figure than he'd ever been before, becoming kind of international uh, well, celebrity do, as a result. Would you, re would you regard the In Cold Blood as a kind of documentary, a reconstruction of actual events? It is. It's very much like a, like a documentary. It, uh, one, most crime, most crime stories done in nonfiction are reconstructions. And they have the strengths and weaknesses of reconstructions. One of the great weaknesses is the dialogue is seldom very good because nobody can ever remember it uh, that well. Or invent it that well. I, I reconstructed a great deal of material in the electric Kool-Aid acid test, but in that case, I was dealing with a group of people, Ken Kesey and his merry pranksters, who have been absolute technological freaks. They, loved to, they were obsessed with the idea of recording their lives in every possible way. And they kept tape recorders running all the time. They even used videotapes. They used tape lag mechanisms. They took movies of their own lives. They kept diaries, which uh, they had strange diaries in which you couldn't write in your own diary. Only other people could write in your diary. This is a kind of and, uh, recycling of themselves. And I, I think very rapidly, too. But one of, the things, one of their ideas was to get very high on LSD and to have videotapes running 
and which you could play back in, what, a minute? Or, uh, or two minutes, anyway. And the, the interval between what they had actually done and what they would now see on a screen was so brief, and they were so high that this became, it's as if all of the lags in life were being uh, overcome. And uh, It's like the, the playback in modern sports. This is a used... This is one of, surely one of the greatest art forms of our time, the instant, instant playback, the instant replay, which concentrates attention on the actual process of the, of the game. I, I, I've asked various footballers, what's this done to your actual play? And they tell me, we've had to change the play, uh, open it up a bit so that people can see it as if it were replay. They use this in teaching tennis now. There are these academies. I'm sure they make a lot of money, too. They get all sorts of people together, and they have people at uh, groups of eight and ten, and they have the videotape running. And after a person takes a few whacks at the ball, they right. bring them into a room, and they show them what they were doing. But think of applying this to everyday life. Well, I think uh, anybody who's heard his voice on a recording is appalled at the condition of his vocalizing. And same when he sees himself on TV, uh, I think he resolves he never wants to look at that or like that again. But uh, I, in other words, the the need, I think the need that the media creates is for acting. That people realize that their just their plain private self is not adequate to the media. And I think this drives people toward dramatizing. And yet it's very hard to dramatize yourself on television, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think? Or... I don't know. We're trying to do it Which right we... <laughs> now. <laughs> and... I'm not feeling very dramatic. I, uh... <laughs> I know that you've been in thinking a lot recently about uh, the idea of the put-on se with several, yeah. uh, several minis. And I believe I heard you say that there were, that there were no great North American symphony conductors. Oh because of, and I never got that straight. Well, this, the it, it's, it's not, it's not a, a, a direct and simple thing to, but it began with my discovery that Americans go outside to be alone and inside to be with people. Now, in all other cultures, uh, Hindu or Russian or Japanese, English, European, people go outside to be with people. They socialize outside, they sit outside, they eat outside, and talk and visit in cafes and, and pubs and bars and so on. And they go home to be strictly alone. They don't invite strangers into their homes. And uh, in America, on the other hand, there is no privacy in the American home, and strangers are often entertained and welcomed. But one of the things is that when an American goes outside, he is himself, uh, he is his private self, he does not put on a mask. Other people, when they go outside, tend to put on masks in speech or in dress or in actions. I suggest that there are no American symphony conductors. Uh, Leonard Bernstein, having grown up in his early years, at least in Vienna, that an American musician, no matter how much he knows about orchestras or about publics, is not able to dramatize himself in the way of putting on the whole orchestra as his private mask or corporate mask, nor is he able to put on the whole public as a mask. Whereas a European would, uh, doesn't even think about this as a problem. When he stands up in front of the orchestra, he ceases to be a private person, becomes an actor instantly. Now, an American not only does not like acting or putting on a public, but he does not put on a corporate or standard voice when he speaks. He uses his private voice. And this, of course, may enables the Americans to have no class consciousness and no class structure. I would explain why they would behave differently in restaurants or in oh, yes. uh, hotels. And when or they're anything. in a movie or when they're at a restaurant, they want to be alone. And they don't want to advert advertisements in movies because they go there with their dates to be alone. Whereas Europeans will put up with conversation in movies and advertisements in movies and so on. They do not go out to be alone. But this, this then led to this whole problem of the put-on. The comic, when he gets up in front of people, puts people on by 
twisting their arms. The jokes the comic tells are the ones that cut very close to the bone and close to home. And unless the jokes come close to home, they don't have any relevance and are, don't have any put on value. So the ethnic jokes are the ones that are closest to home. And uh, the areas where things hurt, where there's abrasive contours and abrasive interfaces and so on. So most jokes tend to have this minority quality or uh, ir irritation quality. And just as games people play often tend to have a rather destructive quality, a violent and destructive thing. But a put on, a put on therefore tends to be a way of hurting the public it's an act of aggression against people. And I think a writer, when he picks up his pen, has to put on his public that way. He has to, if he has something to say, it's going to hurt. I, I remember your predicting once that if the coverage of the war in Vietnam was suddenly withdrawn, uh -huh. that the war would, would uh, grind almost to a halt. And this happened um, during this, the uh, six day or seven day war, Israel and, uh, uh -huh. and Egypt. Uh, suddenly, all of those correspondents uh, for wire services that were all concentrated in Saigon were all suddenly summoned to go to the Middle East. Unfortunately, and, and it was true that in, during that week, the fighting suddenly, and that was fighting was hot at that, at that time, suddenly just it's came, just came down to nothing. Unfortunately, it wasn't a long enough interval uh, to... Well, it, well, I think it might be worth an experiment. Uh, people are always talking about the need to understand media by experimentation. I think it would be worth uh, an experiment in turning them all off for a week. That is, there would be no newspapers, no radio, no TV, no telephones, nothing, for one week. What do you think would happen? What would people, how would they respond to a complete blackout? Well, in Ken Kesey's phrase, this would be a media fast. He wrote a, a, a fast, recent... Yeah. Uh, open letter to Rolling Stone magazine in which no. he said, I am breaking a six-month media fast in order to... <laughs> I like that idea of the, no. uh, of the media fast. Well, would... uh, one, one of the, when there is no news, as, for example, in a prison camp, where there's all news is cut off, there have been studies of what happened or what happens. Enormous outbursts of rumors. The oral thing takes over, and people generate incredible rumors about what's happening, what's going to happen, what's being planned, and so on. So probably there is a kind of control, a rumor control, on cover, by means of coverage, even when it's completely fake. Um, that is, most news is literally fake because it has to be made, then selected, and the very, very tiny bits that are actually written up and reported and presented to the public are fictions in every sense of the word, aren't they? That is, they're fictions in the sense that they do not correspond to actually what's going on. But they are made, literally, created. Do you think this explains the, that really strange fascination that Arthur Bremer had with Sirhan? He obviously looked at Sirhan Sirhan as a, some kind of heroic figure. He wasn't this poor, helpless, useless human being who had done this desperate thing. And that's certainly not in Arthur Bremer's eyes. No, and uh, again, uh, he had made the news. Siran had made the news. Now, this you can take in every sense of the word as having gotten into the news, having been created into a vast figure by the news. Uh, making the news is a very strange phrase, but the media themselves can now create events that are so much bigger than people, so much bigger than the audience that it really is a new mythic form. The coverage of the Vietnam War is done by more people than who are actually fighting in Vietnam. The numbers of people covering the Vietnam business around the world and participating in it through newscasts, the numbers are many, many millions. And so the war then becomes a fiction, a colossal fiction. This is then leads people like uh, Clifford Irving uh, just as much as Bremer into thinking that someone like Howard Hughes can be turned into a myth, a, a great, a genuine fake. Mm -hmm. Well, politicians very quickly learn that if you want to get on the six o'clock news at night, 
that you do it, if you want to get on NBC, you do something in Cleveland before noon. Because if you don't do it before noon, the network doesn't have time to process it and fly it uh, to New York to be, shown, uh, to be shown nationwide. And it has to be something of great magnitude to happen at 3 o'clock and make the 6 o'clock news. So you have this marvelous spectacle of politicians all over the country uh, doing, having a press conference at 10.30 uh, a.m. in Cleveland, and another one is having one at 10.30 uh, a.m. in uh, New Orleans. And of course, they, know, they are so, being so aware of all this, very quickly catch on to it. And commercial enterprises have caught on to the fact that all the networks want on the 6 o'clock news the last item to be something funny. I don't know exactly why this is true. You've, you've oh. been, maybe it's because you've just been slaughtered for half an hour. <laughs> um, and they want, a, they want a little kicker. So it's a, the last item on the news every day is always really a covert advertisement, pure and simple. Like the last one I remember seeing in New York before leaving was a, uh, a group of models in bikinis dressed up in ape suits and went to the <laughs> Central Park Zoo and fed the the monkey in their ape suits, they fed the monkeys bananas. <laughs> and every single local news station and in, in every, in every network in New York ran this thing as the last item on the show. And it was an advertisement for the conquest of the planet of the apes, of course. You say. <laughs> and so it's not so much the networks man, uh, uh, manipulating the news, it's just setting up this well, system this, and then other people use it. To, this is a, raises a, something we haven't really talked about. But uh, that is, the news uh, is in, has to be a put on. It has to put on a public. And so the last uh, comic twist in the news would be a way of dismissing the public and uh, saying, so long. But you know how in laugh -in, they do it that way. They have a rapid roundup at the last as a dismissal of wildly uh, improbable comic turns. Well, Tom, I think there are a whole lot of wonderful topics we've managed to broach at least, but it would take a long time to really get into them. I, you know, what I would really like to do is just run down a checklist of all the predictions you made six years ago that people thought were absolutely crazy that have come true. I remember you were saying once that the, there would be a time when they would have to pay students to go to school. Well, there's a new federal program in the United States and they're doing just that. They figure the only way they can <laughs> Get these large numbers of well, kids interested. Is give them I, a little salary. I have always been very careful never to predict anything that had not already happened. <laughs> and this, this is a, a the future is not what it used to be. <laughs> it Just is take a quicker look through your rearview mirror. It is here. Yeah. And when you look into the rearview mirror, what you ordinarily see is not the car you pass, but the truck that's coming up on you fast. <laughs> never look back. They may be gaining never. on it. <laughs> So th this, you can't, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't lose, you can't win. Uh, the uh, present is, includes the past and the future. <laughs>